Welcome, welcome. Welcome on this day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today's reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. This is out of the New International Version of Scripture. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through the angel was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind that you are so mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at the present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he had suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He was able to help those who are being tempted. These are the scriptures revealing the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, <laughs> We have a lot of ideas of what the perfect man should be. If you uh, go and get a copy of Iron Man magazine, you're going to see that some people think it's a man who obtains the perfect body by spending countless hours working out in the gym, getting himself ripped, getting himself muscular. In the corporate world, well, the perfect man might be someone like Robert Ringer, Robert who wrote that winning through, wrote the book Winning Through Intimidation and looking out for number one as a way to succeed in business. You might think of a man who's been through, I don't know, sensitivity training. Maybe someone who's read Daniel Coleman's book, Primal Leadership, Realizing the Power of Emotional Intelligence, where it talks about self-awareness and relationships. You might think of a celebrity, a singer, uh, a sports figure, <laughs> I don't know, a big city fireman. But how many people would think of Jesus? 
Jesus really was and is the perfect man. Reading through the Bible that contains the story of his life, you, you, you see enormous courage. He stood against the powers of his day, both religious and political. He single-handedly, single-handedly cleared the temple. He stared death in the face and, and didn't back down. He, in, he endured beatings and willingly, willingly stayed on the cross through unimaginable suffering. But yet, he was also one of the most sensitive men alive. He was gentle. He touched lepers. He wept over lost people. He took children into his arms and he blessed them. He ministered to hurting people and spent long hours teaching them and healing them. He stayed up all night praying. He died. Then broke the grip of death in his resurrection. He lives forever as, as a part, as that part of God who can never forget what it's like to be human. Now last week, we talked about the divinity of Christ. This week, we're concentrating on the humanity of Christ. See, Jesus Christ was 100% divine, yes. But he's also 100% human. This is a mystery, the reality of which was lived out in the one we call Jesus the Christ. Now the Bible, talking about Jesus, says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It also says, For Christ, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in the bodily form. You see, the Bible explains how Christ, being both God and man, fulfilled the purpose of God. For this reason, it is written, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Now, the first thing I would like to point out or emphasize this morning is that by becoming a man, Jesus identified with humanity. Jesus came to live among us as one of us. There's nothing, virtually nothing about the human condition he has not personally experienced. The Bible puts it this way. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He was God. He was God who came to live among us. He was a perfect man, but he wasn't Superman. Yet the amazing thing is that he came to live with us in this voluble condition. What do I mean by he wasn't Superman? If he was tempted, he felt the pull of that temptation. If he got cut, he would bleed. If someone would strike him, he would get a bruise. If he was rejected, he felt emotional pain. If he fell, he got hurt. It was possible for him to die. In fact, if he had not been voluble like this, he would not have been the perfect man. Not at all. He would have been a demigod. But not the very real personal human Jesus. You see now, because he was, 
we know he understands us because he was like us. Not many years after the death and resurrection of Christ, a heresy broke out. It was called uh, Doceism. That's right, Doceism. And this Doceism, it arose amongst some who said that Jesus' body only seemed real. You see, the Doceists believed that he could not feel pain. That his body was purely spiritual. There was no form to it. So that if he walked across some sand, he wouldn't even leave a footprint. Or if he walked across the grass, the grass wouldn't bend over because he was purely spirit. They believed he was not human at all, but just totally divine. Now see, this was such a devious heresy because it sounds so spiritual. While it robs Christ of his humanity, and robs us, hear me, it robs us of the assurance that he entered our experience in the fullest sense. If Jesus had not become one of us, he would not have experienced what we feel. We could never be sure if he really, really understood us. And more than that, if he had not become one of us, he could not have died in our place. In order to come for us, he had to humble himself and take on the form of a human. The Bible explains it this way. This is out of uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The Apostle Paul was continually in awe of all that Jesus gave up in order to be with us. He wrote to the Corinthians saying, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He, who was at the Father's side, came to be by your side. He became poor that you might become rich. As the Bible says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, that we might receive the full rights of of sons. Now the second point that is that I want to bring up about Jesus becoming a man, by doing so he dignified humanity. He dignified humanity. I mean think about it. What an enormous compliment that God would become human. God bestowed the ultimate dignity on us when he became one of us. The writer of Hebrews asked this question, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Then he answers this question by saying, You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. The writer of these words is actually quoting Psalm 8. The psalm writer makes it even stronger, though. For in the original language, he says, You have made him a little less than God. It's interesting that this pop culture, this, this woke culture that we live in, reduces us to animals. Animals who are helpless against the urges and instincts which rule us. They try to make us believe that, yeah, we can fight them, but we're never going to overcome them. But the Bible gives us 
this incredible dignity of being a little less than God. It tells us that we were crowned with glory and honor. We have dignity. We have strength. We don't have to live in the gutter. We were created for a position of honor and greatness. We were created with needs, hungers, even passions, but we don't have to let those rule us. We are to rule over them. They're good things. And when we channel these needs and passions in line with God's original design and his original intent for us, they become a source of great blessing. <clears throat> but when we misuse them, they become a source of great shame and regret. These things, these things are a part of our glorified humanity and God intended them for our good. But as in anything, the greater the good, the greater the potential for misuse. The more these things are used in alignment with God's will, the greater blessing they become in our lives. People, we are more than animals. We were made in the very image of God. In the creation of human beings, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In all other acts of creation, think about this. In all other acts of creation, God said, let there be. Let there be light. But in creating mankind, he said, let us make. In all other acts of creation, each creature is described according to its kind. But man and woman are described as being after God's kind, in his image. Men and women bear a resemblance to their creator, unlike any of the rest of the created order. In the creation of plants and animals, the issue of gender, it's never mentioned in the Bible. But in the creation of a man, it specifically says there is male and female, both sharing the divine image, both having dignity, and an elevated position on earth. In none of the accounts of the other created things is there any mention of their position in the created order. But in the creation of men and women, they are given dominion over the rest of creation. We are partners. We are partners with God in ruling the world. The writer of Hebrews says, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. The Bible, the Bible says of those who, are, who have entered into the fullness of their humanity as God's design, but you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The book of Revelation says, he has made us to be a kingdom and priests. Look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. He has made us partners in creation as our children are conceived and born. He has given us dominion over nature so that we might use what we have been given for good. We can enhance our environment and make the world even a better place. 
He has shared his intelligence with us. He has shared his intelligence with us and given us minds so that we are able to develop from our resources things like skyscrapers and automobiles and airplanes and computers and radios and telephones and televisions and so on and so forth. All this is possible because God has given us minds capable of intelligence and creativity. We became partners with God in the healing process as we discovered the laws of physical science which has which he has built into this world. Oh, people, it is so wonderful. It is so wonderful, but the best is yet to come. It's going to get better. The Bible says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. An early uh, forefather of the church named Athenaeus, he wrote, He became what we are, that he, that he might make us what he is. Jesus, the perfect man, dignified humanity when he came to be one of us, when he came as one of us. But when he returns, he will dignify us even further by making us more like him. It'll be wonderful. It will be wonderful. Now the third point is that, by, is that becoming a man, Jesus delivered humanity. Jesus Christ has delivered us from the grip of sin, people. He's removed us from the grip of Satan and death. He has delivered us from them all. The writers of Hebrew, he says, But we see Jesus, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. He goes on to say, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their human humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The Son of God came that you might become a child of God. He did that by giving himself for you upon a cross. As scripture says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself up as a ransom for all men. Again, the Bible says, This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Our beloved Jesus. What a perfect God. What a perfect man. Amen. And amen. God bless you all. Have a spirit-filled week.